What's up guys? Michael here to talk about a wisecrack all-time favorite, The Office. We've covered the pointless grind of working at a paper company or the weird philosophical implications of Dwight K. Schrute, but today I'm here to talk to you about your boss and how they may or may not be trying to convince you and or trick you into caring about your job. And in doing so, they might be a little more Michael Scott than you realize. We'll explain in this wisecrack edition on Michael Scott. And spoilers ahead for The Office. At its core, The Office is a show about a workplace littered with people who kinda suck at their jobs. Like an accountant who can't count. 50, oh, this is a button. Or a quality assurance rep who seems more down for crime than white collar work. And while folks like Oscar and Angela seem competent enough, it doesn't really matter because they're working for the king of incompetence, Michael Scott. I declare bankruptcy! Of course, the show later backtracks on that. Utica, Albany, all the other branches are struggling, but your branch is reporting strong numbers. Before double backtracking to show Michael's incompetence once again. Sometimes I'll start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going. I just hope I find it along the way. Anyway, our useless workers are also joined by our unwilling workers. People who could be good at their job if they gave even the slightest iota of a about what they do. There's Stanley, who passes time napping. Stanley, I thought you hated Halloween. Shh, he wears it so he can sleep at his desk. Doing crossword puzzles and dreaming of retirement. Or the disgraced Ryan, who doesn't do much of anything. A strategy that eventually gets him thrown into a closet. Enjoy it. And of course there's Jim, slacker supreme, who pulls his coworkers, even the motivated ones, into a spiral of unproductive antics for much of the early seasons. When he's excited about something like the Office Olympics, he gets really into it and he does a really great job. But the problem with Jim is that he works here, so that hardly ever happens. He's smart, he just doesn't give a single f Now, some of this can all be chalked up to the pains of working in a bull job, a topic we've covered before. But we actually think it's really interesting because it speaks to a centuries old problem in business, getting people to show up and do their damn job. This might shock you, but showing up to work every day has never been an easy sell. During the long dissolution of feudalism, vagrancy laws were enacted to penalize anyone who wasn't vibing with the whole getting a job thing. The goal, according to sociologist William Chambliss, was to make sure that employers had access to cheap laborers who literally could not turn down a job. After the Industrial Revolution, bosses would struggle to acculturate their employees to workplace practices like not being faced at work, showing up on time, or even just showing up at all. Over the years, workers toiling away in horrible factories would rebel against their bosses by deliberately sabotaging down their work, doing their work poorly, and not showing up. And if those workers were organized, they'd just plain go on strike, a collective version of not showing up that sometimes involved fun signs, and sometimes involved bombs and military intervention. This doesn't really sound like the modern American workplace, of course. While absenteeism remains a problem, most people show up on time, or like five minutes late. That's because we don't have some ancestral farm to return to, unlike Dwight, and most of us would rather show up to a job, even if we hate it, if only to keep the electricity on and the Netflix streaming. But the problem isn't extinct. People like Jim continue to dick around all day, and corporations like Dunder Mifflin continue to try to stop them from doing so, whether by enacting policies against wasting time. Time thief. Time thief. Fire him. Or tyrannically monitoring workers' comp. He's not using crutches. Oh, get, get over the there. camera. Get Oh, workers, oh, my ass. Clearly, this whole struggle to get large groups of people to actually do their jobs persists today and is way more interesting than you'd think. And this is Michael Scott's basic quixotic mission, to get his employees to care, whether that means desperately trying to keep up morale with bizarre award shows. Thank you all for coming to the 2005 Dundee Awards. Or inventing hyper-specific characters to get people to pay attention in meetings. But we can better understand the struggle by going back to the 1970s, a real renaissance period of not doing your job, or at least doing it badly, in the United States and Europe. If today we live in a world where tons of people perform at least mediocrely at work, it's because of what happened in the aftermath of social upheaval in the late 1960s, a time when Creed Bratton was still jamming with the grassroots. This was when managers and the people who studied managers in the Western world, especially France, recognized a serious problem. 
People were not showing up to work, or were generally unmotivated when they did. That's according to sociologists Luke Boltonsky and Eve Cipello, who note that this coincided with an increase in strikes and even physical violence against bosses. What's more, they noticed that the quality of work was flagging due to workers' severe lack of interest in their daily tasks. Obviously, this kind of sucks for a company's bottom line. Jim is the perfect embodiment of this kind of worker, the so-called go-slows, who even deliberately sabotage their workplaces in order to disrupt the daily grind that they loathe. He does this every time he pranks Dwight, every time he screws with Michael, and every time he distracts Pam, aka all day, every day. So how did we go from a world where everyone was gymming it up to one where people check their work emails after a fun Saturday night out with a little thing called Neo Management? And even though he does a pretty bad job at it, Michael Scott is the perfect embodiment of this philosophy. Michael Scott as a manager is a response to everything people initially rebelled against in the late 60s and 70s. As Boltanski and Cipello note, nobody wanted to be a suit or sellout to the man. And this image of stuffy corporate types had a lot to do with the push to make workplaces as scientific as possible. They describe how in the 1960s, there was a transition away from small nepotistic firms and family run businesses to larger companies that required professional legions of managers to run properly. But these larger companies also felt sold people were not engaged with or motivated by their work. So companies faced with this problem started to adapt. And especially in the 1990s, they really started to Michael Scott it up. Basically, it was believed that workplace hierarchies and the resultant dominant dominated relations they inspired were harmful and even immoral. Michael seems to have internalized this message. Now, you may look around and see two groups here. White collar, blue collar. But I don't see it that way, and you know why not? Because I am collar blind. It's a world you might be familiar with. Many workplaces lost their rigid hierarchy. They stripped visible signs of power from those in charge to convince lowly workers that their managers are just their lovable pals. The people that you work with are just, when you get down to it, your very best friends. And this, if nothing else, is the Michael Scott ethos in a nutshell, but taken majorly to the extreme. From the very opening moments of the show's pilot, Michael's number one MO has been simple. Get the people in his workplace to adore him and thus adore their jobs too. Would I rather be feared or loved? Um, easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. What's actually really brilliant about The Office is that by doing this, they took a real workplace phenomenon, in fact, a defining phenomenon amongst this era of managers, and turned it into Michael's number one personality flaw. Michael's drive may be a little more self-centered than just make money, but the result is very much the same. Your boss might slyly try to empower you with a grand vision of your organization's noble goals, or worse, dress up your dull workplace with birthday parties, a ping pong table, and a very jiff heavy company slack. And it might work. But Michael Scott is iconic for just how plainly he shows the reality of these paltry attempts at boosting worker engagement through his own incompetence. He tries to buy ice cream sandwiches after everyone's healthcare was just slashed and throws a murder mystery party to distract from bankruptcy rumors. Across the board, his attempt to spin his coworkers into family is so amazingly cringeworthy because they're so clearly not. What's more, as Boltonsky and Chiapello note, the new era of managers do not seek to supervise or give orders. They have understood that such roles are outmoded. They become team leaders, catalysts, visionaries, coaches, sources of inspiration. This is the description that fits Michael Scott to a T, as the show is littered with talking heads of him aspiring to be some kind of weirdo thought leader. Reverse psychology is an awesome tool. I don't know if you guys know about it, but basically you make someone think the opposite of what you believe, and that tricks them into doing something stupid. And while at first it seems like pure madness, when we understand it in the context of Neo management, suddenly he makes sense. He's doing what many other managers at the time were supposed to be doing. He's just taking it to the nth degree and also really sucking at it. In this era, according to Boltonsky and Cipello, managers also started to stress creativity to combat the whole dehumanizing meat grinder aspect of work. It's a problem we can see with people who, absent any real creative agency in their job, turn to art or the art of pranks. The problem of making your job feel more creative is one even managers suffer from. 
And we see Michael coping in a myriad of ways by recreating an episode of Survivor Man, writing his own movie, making his own commercial, or dressing up like Willy Wonka for a harebrained promotion. Michael doesn't want his workplace to be some inhuman meat grinder, which is why it pains him so much to fire anyone. Oh man. Okay, I have to fire somebody. Or put a family paper company out of business. My heart says no. It's why he insists that his constant fun distractions are good for his workers. It's also why he responds so negatively to Charles Minor a manager with experience in the old school steel industry that probably doesn't value creativity as much as your new social media startup. Interestingly enough, The Office debuted in 2005, just about a decade after these ideas were percolating. In fact, to be technical, Michael Scott was still in the early days of his Dunder Mifflin career as the discourse really started going down. And so it makes sense that he embodies the entire ethos just way to a fault. Whereas good neo-managers attempted to connect with their workers on a personal level, Michael Scott's attempts at familiarity are constantly straining relationships, driving people absolutely bananas, and actively disrupting their focus. From getting too involved in people's relationships to trying to force an employee into rehab, there was no way. There is no way. There is no way. There is no way. No to divining the sexuality of another employee and then outing him to the whole office. Can you tell this gay and who's not? Of course. What about Oscar? Absolutely not. Well, he is. In one telling episode, we literally learn what we basically already knew, that Michael's antics, far from fostering a healthy workplace, are actually the single greatest cause of stress in his employees' lives. Michael, Let would, me get would, you? You, would you step back, please? Okay, please. all right. A little further. Okay. Of course, as much as Michael tries to convince everyone that they're a family of equals, there is still a hierarchy at the office. Michael Scott is the boss. Still, even when he does boss stuff, like making everyone attend wildly inefficient group meetings, it's always for the greater purpose of getting closer to them. But while he might spend his time pretending he's everyone's friend, it takes Stanley openly defying him to reveal that at the end of the day, Michael is in charge. Even if, again, he's not very good at it. This was a fake firing. Now, neo-management thinkers encountered another growing problem in the 90s. Workers also just didn't want creativity, they wanted purpose. A fat paycheck wasn't enough. People wanted to know they were making a difference or changing the world. It's why every dumb new social network startup will brag about connecting the world and making people's lives better. It's a struggle I'm sure many of you watching this deal with, as you ask questions like, why toil away at a job until I'm old and spiritually dead inside? A question familiar to both Pam and Jim. I just, I don't think it's many little girls dream to be a receptionist. It's a problem framed at the top of the show with Jim's first talking head. My job is to speak to clients um, on the phone about uh, quantities and uh, type of copier paper. Basically, Jim's job is A, boring and B, pointless. And even after Michael is gone, the way the show ends up with a happily ever after is to give Jim a job that is fun, but able to retroactively give his time at Dunder Mifflin a purpose. It was all worth it, you see, because Jim built a family and even married his coworker. His final talking head here mirrors his opening one, only with the added purpose of love. My job was to speak to clients on the phone about quantities and types of copier paper. Even if I didn't love every minute of it, Everything I have, I owe to this job. Heartwarming stuff. But it's ultimately fitting that Jim's arc is to land a job that allows him to be creative. While the details about his new job are vague, we know that he gets a job with Athlete, a sports marketing company that is allegedly more creatively fulfilling than the paper business. He gets to play ball with his heroes, read their bad screenplays. Megan, I was too shy to tell you this when I was just a normal professional baseball player but I love you. And work in a place with poorly placed basketball hoops, AKA Neo Management done right. But back to Michael. While he fails to instill creativity and purpose in the workplace, the thing he's really trying to do is again, an aggressively real phenomenon. See all the creativity and purpose can often hide another truth. Your boss can't pay you more, so how else do they get you to work harder? Reading modern day management literature, you may not be surprised to learn that things like unlimited vacation days save companies money because you take less of them. And perks like snacks are often valued by employees more than cash. In other words, I'd rather take a job that paid $5,000 less if I got $500 of kombucha and a limited cold brew on tap. 
See, as the economy changed, work became more competitive, and opportunities to rise in the ranks of your company shrank significantly. This loss of hierarchy meant less manager-type positions to move up into, and companies always looking to increase their profit margin looked to get more out of people for less. As a result, your manager couldn't always use the motivation of a raise or a real promotion. We see this very plainly when Michael gives Dwight an in-name-only promotion, which functionally does nothing to change his job or pay rate. I am promoting you from assistant to the regional manager to assistant regional manager. Another way managers make workers feel motivated is by assigning their underlings tasks that are actually managerial work to make them feel more valued. Think of that time when Michael let Dwight pick their new healthcare plan. For that matter, Dwight regularly takes on managerial tasks, responding to Michael's lack of days with overly fervent supervising. These strategies are all part of a larger attempt to get you to emotionally engage with your job and the people you work with. But are there risks to this? I.e., what happens when your boss does have an emotional hold over you? Because rest assured, Michael, in spite of his very alienating methods, certainly does have that emotional hold over at least some of his workers. Dwight would literally kill for him. And one of the show's most memorable moments is when Pam leaves Dunder Mifflin to follow Michael on his quest to form his own paper company. This reflects a real effect of good neo-management, which is that people get a new kind of investment in their job. The investment of, as noted by Boltonsky and Cipello, not only their technical skills, but also their creativity, their sense of friendship, their emotionalism, and so on, i.e. your full damn self. This can, though does not always, result in one of your coworkers being your best man. I can't believe you came. That's what she said. So what gets lost when your work life disappears into your life life? New risks of exploitation, according to our friendly management nerds. And that's concerning because neo-management has been widely propagated, which is to say, Michael Scott's don't happen in a vacuum, and his bizarre behavior is evidence of something very real. In this way, The Office actually functions as a really good case study of why your boss shouldn't feel like your family. Because when that happens, it's a whole lot easier for your work to become your life. Now, I'm not saying you can't like your boss and that sometimes getting the invites to his elaborate dinner parties isn't dope. Can you not do that? It's disgusting. You know I have soft teeth. And there's plenty of great bosses who will stand up for their employees. And to all the managers at Omnia Media and Enthusiast Gaming, I love you, and no matter what I just said, you're my family. But if we look at all those other companies, we can see how neo-management tactics, whether it's playing Call of Duty for team building or holding a spirited beachside competition for promotions, are almost uniformly designed to blur the personal professional line. But the next time your boss tries to act like a family member, ask yourself what he or she is really trying to do. It's possible they're just trying to get more work out of you for the same amount of money. But what do you guys think? Is The Office a wholesome tale about workplace unity, or a secretly kind of sinister look at what happens when the boundaries between work and real life blur beyond recognition? Let us know in the comments. Slam that subscribe button in half like it's your company's ping pong paddle, and be sure to ring that bell. Big thanks to our patrons for your support, and as always, thanks for watching. Later.